Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again open the book of Judges, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may have the understanding to observe and understand the symbols that are being presented here and may properly apply them for this time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that we are able to come together, that we are able to openly study and consider the words of this book, the examples herein, and the symbols as they pertain to our time. Direct us now, help us, so that that which we do will bring glory to you, to your character, and to the work that you would have done. May your will be done. I thank you for each one that is attending this morning's meeting. May this meeting be fruitful. May the participation help us each one to understand what we need to understand for this time in our history. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, yesterday we were getting close to the end of the chapter, and there were some symbols for us to consider. Now, as we, as we were taking a look here, where Gideon is defeating Midian, we see that Gideon and the, and the hundred men that were with him, so one third of the 300 went with Gideon, came under the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, which we've identified as midnight. And they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. So the watch in the Midian camp is now set. Gideon is giving the example to the men that are with him. They blow the trumpet. I would have to say that this is a trumpet of war. This is not convocation. This is not warning. <clears throat> this is to show the great day of the Lord that we've been studying from the book of Zephaniah. And they break the pitchers which were in their hands. So what were these earthen vessels that were broken? What symbol can we apply here? Well, it would represent self. Okay. I mean, the simple, simple thing is self must be destroyed in order for Christ's character to shine forth. And what does the torch represent? Well, that would be Christ's character. Okay. So the earthen vessel in the representation of self is to be destroyed. So Christ's character can then be shown. The trumpet has been blown. The men of the tribes that are blowing the trumpet are representative of what? Okay, well, so, so we have a message that's given. The 300 is a message that's given. This is the message of the loud cry. Uh, it's, we, we know that um, in order for this message to be given, it's not so much about an intellectual message. It's about a character. But there still is a message, 
right? I mean, there still is something that's said. Um, but in, unless Christ's, Christ's character is, is upon us, the message would have no power. Could we say instead of upon us, that unless we have hold of Christ's character, mm -hmm. would that okay fit within this example? But it's Christ's character that's being shone forth, not man's character. Right. So to imagine that we could uh, give the warning about Nashville and that it would be fulfilled when all this kind of jealousy, infighting, and, you know, basically sin, character assassination, all these different things that happened in the movement that still occur, uh, we can't accomplish that work unless that work of being united with Christ and with one another is first accomplished. So we keep putting the cart before the horse. doesn't mean that you don't study and try to understand God's word, but you can't expect that, that this message is going to be given in power while we still uh, have our own characters being represented. So this whittling away that happens with Gideon's message is that refining process. It's the refining process, not just of people, you know, being taken out, but also of character of the individuals within the movement. Agreed. Can we say that the 300 are given a, a choice as to when to break this picture? Well, I don't know if there's a choice. I mean, there's, there's a point in which that occurs. I mean, obviously there's a choice, but we move along the path of the message and if we stay along that path that will occur all right the, the problem is that people fall off the path right the path is the light of the midnight cry and it and it still continues and it's about the perfection of christ's character and his people i mean that's really clear in the spirit of prophecy it all ends up finally with the hundred and forty four thousand you know, standing on the sea of glass. I mean, we think that there is some other way, that there's going to be some shortcut. I mean, that's really what I thought, you know, back on July 18th, is that people, people were looking at this as a shortcut. It was a way of avoiding the cross, a sort of vindication of our human characters, which you know, made no sense to me. Okay. You understand, you understand my point, right? No, I'm understanding the point, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just, all, all I'm, I'm looking at in the same basic line is we have symbols that are being presented here with Gideon. And how we apply these symbols are going to be very important for our, for our understanding of what's going on within the movement and what is to be done yet in giving this message. Yeah, well, July 18th to July 21st. I mean, that's from if, you know, Judges 718 to Judges 721. Um, this is this message that... Gideon said, when I blow the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Right. So then you're going to get to verse 21. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. So after they have blown the trumpet. So there's this period of time from July 18th to midnight, Samuel Snow's last letter being published and to to boston 
that I think is represented here by this movement. That's that period of three days that um, we've talked about. So one thing I've argued is that we've never actually come to midnight yet. So midnight would be a little further down the line. Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, on you know, when we talk about midnight, I'm talking about midnight in the repeat of history. Are we speaking of midnight on the big line? Well, there is no midnight on the big line. Okay. So, so the big line has the Sunday law, and then we have the repeat of history where we have 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, and then the Sunday law. So if you call that the big line for this, for the repeat of history, yes, that would be the midnight that's still future. Okay. So they are given this cry. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Mm -hmm. The sword of the Almighty and those that are cut off. So Gideon and the 300 are those that are cut off. They are the remnant. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, that would make sense. Um, so you're just taking this word Gideon to mean somebody that's cut off? Correct. I mean, there, there's one way you can look at this as hewer. Yeah. But it's also can be, can be uh, translated as cut off. Yeah, but that's, yeah, but it, it the idea is it's, it's, um, it's the word doesn't mean to be cut off. It's somebody who cuts down something. It's a hewer or a feller, right? Somebody who cuts down trees. So, so I know what you're saying, but that it's not the remnant. It's the thing that causes the cutting off. It's, it's the message that causes the separation. Right? That's the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Okay. So it's the dividing message. Very much a dividing message. Yeah. So, so that's the way I would understand. When, when we look at dividing messages that have occurred, how many do we see? I don't know what you mean by how many. Is, is the message of Leviticus 26 a dividing message between the movement and the church? Yeah, but you asked how many dividing messages. Right. I mean, there's thousands of dividing messages. Okay, the point that I'm trying to drive at is that we have a message that has divided us from the corporate church. Okay, how many stages of divisions that occur? That we can look talking? at it that way too. But what, I, what I'm getting at, you, you take a look at the fact that the message of Leviticus 26 has created a division between the corporate church and those within the movement. Mm -hmm. You have a division within the movement regarding the message of the book of Joel. Okay. You have a division within the movement regarding the message of July 18th. Yeah, but there's many other dividing messages that occurred in this movement. 
you know, if you start from 1989, um, every time new light came, people left the movement. I mean, you had a dividing message back in 2015, uh, just over uh, whether we, how we would understand Vashti and Esther. I mean, that was a dividing message. Right, so that a whole group of people left a camp meeting over that message. You had a dividing message over whether uh, we should have uh, public evangelism or not. You know, so there was lots of different dividing messages that occurred. I don't know if you would just take the ones that you've mentioned. In this in the example that we have here. Mm -hmm. Well, you have just the, the example of you have 32,000 32, and then you have 22,000. Leave that so you have 10,000 and then it's divided into 300. So you have 10,000 minus 300 that leave. So you just have the three steps if, if that's what you're trying to point out. Well, I'm, I'm actually pointing out that there's four because you have a message that goes out to certain tribes that does not go to all of Israel. The issue with the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children of the East is an issue that comes before these selected tribes. Mm -hmm. We know that Israel, while it is technically united, is not united. Otherwise, all of these enemies would be coming against all of Israel at one time. We don't find this where Judah or Simeon are joining in with Manasseh, Asher, and the other tribes that are called by Gideon. We don't find Benjamin being called in on this. So I'm looking at this and asking the question, if there is a major item that creates a type of division, such as Leviticus 26, and then the others are making division within that portion that remains that has accepted the validity of Leviticus 26. Would that be a possibility or am I off the mark? Well, uh, the only thing is, uh, I think you have to look at each individual line and decide. I mean, it's always a three-step testing prophetic message. So, because we have all kinds of way marks, we have all kinds of divisions, we have all kinds of messages that have been given since 1989 that have caused division and separation in this movement. But when we look at the story itself, I mean, first you have this period of oppression. So what we're trying to do is apply this to this movement at this time. And so the, the enemy that's left over, the Midianite enemy, um, would have to refer to some error that's left in this movement at the, that we're still dealing with. And, and then you're going to have Gideon with a message that's going to address this, this, this idolatry. But in order for this, this to be accomplished, there is this refining process that occurs. So I think it happens in three steps. I don't 
really see the fourth step, but that's kind of a minor point. The point is we can't keep bringing this to the corporate church because this isn't about the corporate church if we're making this these applications. Right, we would have to look at what's happening within this movement. And and this message would have to all be about July 18th. It can't be about Leviticus 26. All right. That is, that is I see this as being from July 18th <clears throat> to a point we call midnight. So some kind of refining point in which this message then is given in clarity that we do have the character of Christ, that we are united, and that we do overcome this enemy. So to me, this would be not about 2014 or 2017. This specifically would have to refer to the message of July 18. We just keep we keep trying to bring, make this too broad. We need to narrow the focus of what what we're looking at here with the story of Gideon. I'm not saying that we can't make an application on a larger scale, but the way that we've interpreted judges is, is it's referring to internal messages within this movement. That's the application that we're trying to understand. Does that make sense? Okay, you're making a good point. So if we're going to make this about the internal messages, <clears throat> is Judges 7.19, where Gideon and the hundred men that are with him, as they break the pitchers that surround the torches, mm -hmm. this is an application strictly about July 18th? Mm -hmm. the, well, after July, it's the period from July 18th to midnight for this movement. Okay. Right. Because midnight is where all of this work that July 18th has been about. Because it's Samuel Snow's letter, July 18 letter, and then he's going to be at Boston at midnight. That's where this movement is moving towards since July 18th. Okay. So, so at this point, I mean, I'm not, so at this point here, you know, we can say this is July 18th, but I would still even take all of the other, other parts as that development of that message leading to July 18th. So we blew the trumpet on July 18th, right? I mean, we began to blow the trumpet in connection with the July 18 message. Okay. That was the blowing of a trumpet because it was a message about Islam, right? Because it was based upon the understanding of Revelation 9, right? I'm, I'm not arguing that point. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at, at this moment. For the symbols of Islam within this portion of Judges chapter 7. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing three companies. I'm seeing three groups that are united in giving a message. Yeah. The first group breaks their pictures reveals their torches and cries out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The other groups directly follow after this is going on, right? From the way that this is written. Yeah, because you're going to have his Gideon's group break their pitchers and all three companies break their pitchers and blow their trumpets. Okay. Yeah. Now, in the past 
we've had an example that was presented of three groups that would come to follow within the movement, the, the message that was to be given. And we've labeled them at, at various times, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanel. Does that apply with this as well? No. Because that's a wrong application to begin with. Okay. So I don't accept the priests, Levites, and Nethanim as um, three different groups in this in this movement. Okay, so that that understanding should then be set aside. Yeah, because I think that we we it was so messed up by Parminder that we look at them as like three different lines. It it's about a progression. So I'm not saying that they're three different lines. Yeah, but but there isn't three different groups. That's not what's okay. But what I'm saying in this in this example in Gideon. Yeah, but this would be related to to priests, Levites, and Nethanims. We have this is all the same group, but they are all breaking their pictures. They're, they're not all mm -hmm. simultaneously doing this. That's all I'm getting at. Okay. Well, yeah, the one group starts first and then the other ones follow. So, um, but this wouldn't be priests, Levites, and Nethanims. This is the same, same message. I'm agreeing that they're all the same message, but I'm also saying that these three divisions are are unified, but mm -hmm. one division breaks the picture, destroys their the humanity of this situation first, mm -hmm. and the others follow suit. Yeah. So, so you would want to figure out what the three companies are within this movement? What I'm saying is that these are three that are united, but they are not three that do everything simultaneously. Right. Okay. The first group has an understanding because they're being led by Gideon. Mm-hmm. They are given their instructions by Gideon. Uh -huh. The others follow after the first group and do what in, in like kind exactly what the first group has done. Uh -huh. So we couldn't make this priest, Levites, and Nethanim. Could or could not? We cannot. Okay. I'm saying that the first group has kind of a head start in their understanding. They're able to explain because they are given the word by Gideon directly. Mm-hmm. As we've spoken before, you cannot present a message if you do not understand the message. All of the groups here are understanding the message, but it's the first group that presents it first. And the others follow after. Yeah, so this will all be leading up to midnight. All right. Right, so it's not going to be till midnight that we give a message to the Levites. As you, as you just said, we need to set that aside. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that further. I'm, I'm letting this go so that 
the conversation can continue. I'm just labeling this first group and the others. Yeah, so why it's divided into the three camps, or the three groups that are going to surround the enemy. Um, I'm saying yeah. three divisions. Yeah, I know. I know. I understand that. So, so these would be, I mean, these could even be, um, because we know people all around the world are studying this message. Right. But, you know, they're, they're at different stages in their understanding. Do these three divisions have a difference in their understanding of this message? Mm -hmm. Well, they would have to, to some degree. But, you know, I mean, the number three can be a symbol. It doesn't literally mean that we would have to find three different divisions within this movement, um, you know, in a literal sense, number three. But we do have different people studying this message on different levels. And my belief is that they will become united in giving a message, which is what this is showing. And it's it, and it starts with the message of July eighteenth, but it continues to develop into something else. All right. So here on, on Judges 720, and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Why the, why the torches in their left hand and the trumpet in their right? What does this symbolize? What is the right arm of the gospel? Well, the right arm is the health message because it opens the door through which the body can pass. But I don't think yeah. that's what's being referred to here. Why? Um, because of the context. I mean, the trumpet message here is the message of July 18th. It's not the health message. And what else is it? Well, the right hand represents lots of different things, not just a health message. That's just one example. Okay, let's name several. Well, you have the right hand of God. So Jesus sits down on the right hand of God. What would that represent? Well, that's not part of this example. The right hand of God would be power and authority. Right. So this is a message of a power and authority. I mean, the first time that the right hand is men mentioned is Genesis 13, 9, where you have a choice, right? The right hand or the left hand. That is, Lot... Um, is going to choose uh, to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? But the right hand and the left hand is a choice, so it can represent uh, a time of decision.
right? You also have the right and the left hand in Genesis 48 with the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, so I'm just saying that right hand can symbolize different things. We wouldn't just say every time we see right hand think health message. That's all I'm saying. And, and I don't see that the context here would be that the trumpet is the health message. Then why the lamp in the left hand? Well, that would be the word of God, right? Okay, that's one symbol. <clears throat> yeah. But what is the symbol for the left hand? Well, the left hand represents um, the north, doesn't it? Or is it the south? I always get mixed up, we think. It depends on how you're facing. Yeah, but in the Bible, because uh, the word left hand means, uh, here, I'll just look it up. It's the north. The left hand's in the north. Okay. <clears throat> so this can represent two different messages, too. Uh, the message of the north is what message? I've always thought of it more as a, of coming destruction. Well, yeah, but as far as in, in this movement, we have two representations of a message. We have the message of the North, which is Stephen can explain it better. Well, the papacy, the king the of the north. Right, the papacy. And then the trumpet would be Islam, right? Are those the two messages that this movement has given? That is, you got 1989 and 9-11. Is, is that the two messages? Daniel was 40 to 45, and uh, the message connected with September 11th. Yeah. So that would be more consistent. You, un you understand, Dwight? I'm I'm listening to follow. Okay. I mean this I mean this would be th that message is represented when Trump is speaking before NATO, right? And and he's talking about on his one hand he has uh parts of the wall that came down in 1989 as a uh, a memorial and then on the other side he has some of the pillars from the Twin Towers on the other side. Right, so that's, to me, that's what this message is about, those two events, 1989 and 9-11. So those are the messages that are the foundation of this message of Gideon. All right. So, The left of the paper, the left being that of the message regarding the papacy, the light, and the trumpet being that regarding Islam. Mm -hmm. hmm. 1989 and 9 11, that's what's being represented there. Now, in the chat, the comment is made regarding Nehemiah 4 13 to 21. Is there an application for that? Well, that's when they're building the walls. Right. 
right? And they're going to have a, a sword in one hand and a tool in the other. Because here we have neither sword nor tool. We have lamp and we have trumpet. Yeah, but there's still kind of a similar symbol. Similar idea. It, it's a parallel illustration. And then it says in verse 20, in what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. So actually you have some of the people holding the spears, some of the people working. So you had half the people protecting them, half the people working. So it's not the left and right hand in this case, but it's still a similar idea. In verse 18, it says that the swords were by their, their sides. Yeah. They, Everyone they, had they, a sword by the side. So he was ready to handle it if he had to. Yeah. They all, they all have a sword on their side, but half the group's working and half the group's standing watch. Okay. Verse 721. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. So you have 300 standing with a lamp and a trumpet. They're standing around the camp. And their enemy, the Midianites, have run and fled. Are they running because of the clarity of the message? Or are they running because of the sound of the trumpet? Well, the sound of the trumpet isn't that a clarity of the message? It'd be the well, same thing, but anyway. No, I'm the okay. The lamp would be the message, wouldn't it? Well, both of them are the message. There's two messages here the lamp and the trumpet. The trumpet gives a certain sound. So, I mean, it's both. Both of them are what caused the people to flee. I guess I'm having a hard time seeing this as two messages. Not 1989 and 9/11. You don't, don't aren't see they this. aren't they the same message just given at two different times? Well, they're not the same message. I mean, they're part of a message that's given because it's the first and second angels messages, right? So you can't have a, a second without a first. So these two messages, this is the repeat of history, of Millerite history, that, that these messages represent. But they're manifest in this movement, and especially in connection with July 18th, everything comes together. So this is about the proclamation of the message of July 18th, and it still is being proclaimed. See, the application that you're placing here, Mm -hmm. I've, I've always looked at the three angels message and the fourth as being elements of one overarching cohesive message. Mm -hmm. Which is the everlasting gospel. Because as we, as we would, as we would go through this, the first angel being fear God. The second to give glory to him. And we haven't reached the third yet. 
because they're not recognizing the hour of God's judgment. Well, we did, I mean, the third angel's message arrived October 22nd, 1844, but we know that that message has to be empowered, and that hasn't happened. And it's going to be the second angel's message that joins it in Revelation 18, the Sunday law, in which that message is then empowered. So on the big line of Ellen White, her line, Revelation 18 is the second angel's message repeated, right? The fourth angel, as we call it. But it's the second angel, right? It's going to join the third. So that's future. That's the Sunday law. Except that our message is you can't have a third without a first and a second, since those messages were rejected in our history. The first and second angels' messages are repeated. And the symbols of those are 1989 and 9-11. So those are the messages that are then going to be empowered, because we know this is the Sunday law in, in, in the bigger picture of looking at the story of Gideon. We understand that this is the Sunday law, right? I'm, I'm just listening so I hear your point. Okay, so, so we know that that's the Sunday law because that's what we, we taught. That's what Jeff taught. And, and so we're not denying any of that. What we are saying, though, is we've made now a special application to judges that it has to address within this movement. But those symbols are still there. 1989 and 911 are still symbols that have to be understood within our movement. But in order for them to be fully empowered within this movement, these earthen vessels have to be destroyed. And the enemy here, that's what we still really haven't defined in the story of Gideon, what the enemy is. So, so there is some enemy that exists that has been allowed to exist because it hasn't been addressed by God's people. So it's been left to prove or test us. That's how we're understanding this. So whatever the enemy is, it's going to be the breaking of these pictures in surrounding the enemy that's going to give this victory. And it, and it could be very much that, you know, this, this enemy has to do with the spirit of criticism. I mean, it's not even something that's more external, even though the Midianites, in a sense, are an external enemy. But it might refer to something that's much more internal, an internal enemy within this movement, something that has to be addressed. So it could be just, you know... Gossip. That could be the enemy. But the victory comes with an understanding of the message. Because the reason God gave us the message was to defeat the enemy. He gave us the understanding of scripture and prophecy. Uh, not to just deal with the intellect you know, so that we could be intellectual and know things, but because he wants to address the entire character, the entire person. And this has always been the problem in the movement, because one is we're made up to a large degree from people who were Adventists, who were disaffected, treated badly by the church in various ways. And we have this human bitterness that is actually hindering us. We, we look at the problems of others, but we don't see the problems that exist within ourselves. And, and I hear, this is just my perspective, but when I hear people talk about the church or talk about other people or whatever it is, it's almost an exalting of self instead of um, a humility in understanding that um, when we're, when, as you talk about, when we're pointing a finger at someone else, we have three pointed at ourselves. Right. And that's the case in every situation. When you see sin in someone else, you know that you're, you're condemning yourself. 
but we're not willing to look at that problem. And, and so this is, could be just in this application that we're making of judges is a part of the story in which this movement addresses this major problem that has plagued it, that has been at its heels, so to speak, um, ever since this movement began. And, and I believe that that's what God's been pointing us to because, you know, Brian had asked a few days ago, whichever day it was, I can't remember, but about the division that exists within the movement. You know, what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, obviously we have to start with ourselves, but in some ways that's where we start and, and end because that's the only place that we have control of. But if we can be converted truly, it will have an effect on others. Because it'll provide a, a better example. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it provides a better example. Um, but it, it gives power to the message. When people are converted, you know, Ellen White says it's not going to be so much by argument, but by the action of the Holy Spirit, you know, that people are going to be converted. Doesn't mean that we don't spend time studying and trying to understand things and, and have arguments. But if those arguments don't do anything to change us, then, you know, we're just whited sepulchers. Okay. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah in Zeriath, and to the border or the lip of Abel Mehola unto Tabath. Yeah, so you got the house of the Shittim tree or the acacia tree. What's important about the acacia tree? Well, we know that uh, it was used for making the ark. Okay. What else was it used for? Um... Um, let me see. Um, the sanctuary. Um, it's just uh, the table of showbread. So if it was the table of showbread, is that not showing us the throne of God? Was used throughout the sanctuary. It's one of the main woods that's used throughout the sanctuary. Okay. Now, if I'm if I'm reading this right, was the the bush the burning bush where God appeared to Moses was that acacia? I don't know. How, how do you find that? I'm just, I'm doing a look up on anything having to do with the acacia. And one of the English versions was trying to state that this is what that bush was. Yeah, that, well, yeah, I doubt it. Because that's a bramble. Okay. Which, uh... So is the altar of offering made of acacia wood? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like the the you're talking about the the you're talking about the altar of burnt offering. Yes. Um, that I'm not sure. Exodus 38. Okay. Uh, yeah. It says it's also. Yep. Yeah, so they're using Shittim wood there too. It seems kind of odd that you would make an altar of burnt offering with wood. So there must be wood at least in part of the structure, but you also have the brass as well. Sure. So the host fleeing to the house of the acacia tree mm -hmm. it has so many symbols within the sanctuary what about zaria uh, oppression okay isn't sin in our lives oppression Mm -hmm. Now, Abel Mehola. Yeah, the metal of dancing. And then Tabath. Um, celebrated. So, I'm not sure what that particularly would mean. That's what it means, celebrated. Hasn't man celebrated his wisdom in the different methods of biblical interpretation? Yeah, well, this is just representing false worship. Okay. So the host is running away from the message and they are running toward false worship could that be applied here would that be a correct application mm -hmm. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. As we were talking yesterday, there is one tribe that is missing here from those that were addressed to begin with. Um. Well, yeah, you're going to have Ephraim in verse 24. He's going to send messengers throughout all the Mount of Ephraim. So he's going to invite those from Ephraim here. He just didn't invite them earlier. Okay. The Midianites are going to come up even, or excuse me, the Ephraimites are going to come up a bit later. Well, verse 24, it has them. And in the next chapter. Okay. But they are invited there is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, so chapter 8.
Okay. Here we've got Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh. But in Judges 6.35, the messengers went out throughout all of Manasseh. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and to Naphtali. Yeah, so they don't mention Zebulun here. Why is Zebulun mentioned in 635 and not in 723? Because they're not involved in this battle in 723. So Zebulun rejects joining with Gideon? No, it's just he's he's just not involved in this part. Okay. Now what was the symbol of Zebulun? Well, so with Zebulun, I mean, that's what I'm working out. We have three three thousand one hundred is the difference between the tribe of Zebulun in Numbers 2 and Numbers 26. Um, so we're, when we're looking at some of these symbols, what I've been looking at is the difference, or we could call it the division of these tribes, right? So um, Zebulun uh, is going to gain 3,100 uh, uh, soldiers from numbers two to numbers 26. Asher is going to gain 11,900, which is, of course, a symbol of 9-11. Uh, Naphtali is going to lose 8,000. Uh, Manasseh is going to gain 20,500. And Ephraim is going to lose 8,000, just like Naphtali does. So these are the tribes that are actually addressed here in this story of Gideon. So you have five of them, Zebulun, Ephraim, Manasseh, Asher, and Naphtali. And five so, of 12. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think there's something in the symbolism of these, um, uh, the numbers of these tribes. So I know, I mean, definitely 11,900 for Asher is a symbol. And then we have Ephraim and, and Naphtali both have lose 8,000. Okay. So these tribes, the men of these tribes, are pursuing the Midianites. As we look further, we have a new subject. We have a new division. Mm -hmm. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Yeah, take before them. So he's telling them where they need to uh, set up their, basically their military. So they're going to take these uh, waters. Okay. Now, when we're looking at Beth Bara, what are we looking at? We're looking at the house of the Ford. Yeah, so there's some city there built by the Ford, uh, where they Ford uh, the Jordan. Was this where uh, John the Baptist? Don't his baptizing. I think so. I think you're correct. Mm -hmm. So if this is where, where John the Baptist 
Baptist who's doing the baptizing, what else can we apply here? Well, the other thing is, you know, if we're taking this as a message, um, you know, inviting Ephraim, wouldn't that be inviting the another group of people, maybe representing the church or the or the Levites? I don't know how to address that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, northern northern Israel is Ephraim, but I mean, these are all northern Israel. It's just Ephraim represents as a symbol all of northern Israel, and other places in the Bible later on. But um, well, but Gideon's going to make this invitation to those at Mount Ephraim, right? And it kind of reminds me of Second Chronicles twenty nine and thirty, where. Um, Hezekiah is going to make this uh, invitation to um, northern Israel to the to celebrate the second Passover. But then you have this this place of where John the Baptist is going to baptize. All right. But Gideon is giving a call to all Mount Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Gideon of the tribe of Manasseh, the half tribe, is calling the others of that half tribe, his brothers, mm -hmm. come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Bethabara and Jordan. Now, when he's saying take before, is he saying to defend the waters? Is he uh, saying secure the waters? Well, that would be to set up a defense there, yeah, so that um, that's where you would end up attacking. So it's a, it's a military strategy. Because they're going to want to cross the Jordan, right? They want to escape. Yeah. And so he's going to block their way of escape. Ephraim's going to do that. So the call to Ephraim is answered. The men of Ephraim gather themselves together and took or defended the waters unto Beth, Bara, and Jordan. Now, Father Miller would see waters as being representational of people. We have the house of the Ford. We have the Jordan River. You cross the Jordan to come into the promised land, coming one direction, and you cross the Jordan to leave the promised land and go into the, technically, into the outer darkness if you go the other direction. So you have a people that are fleeing from the battle that they have started and they want to get back to safety, but that's not going to happen here because the men of Ephraim are defending the waters. Is there anything else that we should consider here? Is there any other symbol that comes to mind here?
All right. <clears throat> and they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Z, Raven and Wolf. And they slew Oreb upon the rock, Oreb, upon the rock, Raven, the black rock. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, or the winepress of the wolf. And pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So are these heads being presented to Gideon on the east side of the Jordan or on the west side of the Jordan? What's the other side symbolizing here? Hmm. Well, it's hard to tell here uh, which side he's on. In Judges 8 4, he's going to pass over the Jordan. Right. We so, haven't gotten that far yet. I know, but I'm just saying since he passes over the Jordan, is that the first time he passes over the Jordan? So that means he would have been on the east side of the Jordan until Judges 8.4. Is that what's happening? Is that how it's seen? I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand the, where this battle is taking place. And well, if the, if the Ephraimites are defending the waters at the ford. Yeah. Would it not seem logical that Gideon's giving instruction, don't let them escape across the Jordan to the east? Yeah, that's what I would think. So so he's on the east side, but so that would mean some of the army had gone across the Jordan, and that's what he's telling them to do, because this battle, where is the battle taking place exactly? I'm saying it's taking place on the west side of the Jordan, trying to keep them from escaping east, and that Gideon is doing some kind of a cleanup to the east side of the Jordan to keep them from going further east. Yeah, I don't know if that's correct, though, because um, the rock Oreb is on the east side of the Jordan. So... So where is this Midianite camp located? So I, I haven't visualized this yet, where it all is. Okay. Where does it say that our is on the east? I'm just going by the dictionary, by the dictionary. All right, okay. Yeah. Well, if the Midianites made the children of Israel live in dens in the mountains and caves and strongholds, then they had come from the east into the areas of the tribes. So they had crossed yeah. the Jordan onto the west side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. That's what it, that's the way I pictured it, but um, I'm just not sure if I had understood it correctly. Okay, so I'm asking the question, is it possible that we're looking at the battle being within that of Israel and they're just trying to keep these three enemies from 
crossing the Jordan to get back to their strongholds. Okay, so that that kind of makes so so they've come over onto the the west side of the Jordan. That's where the enemy has come from, right? The enemy has come from the east side. They've come into Israel on the west side. Right. So now Ephraim, which is um, able to to take that forward because they're going to be Ephraim's going to be um, at that time on the on the west side of the Jordan, right next to Manasseh. But they they would have access to the Jordan River and to the ford crossing. So that's why he calls these people from Ephraim to. So he sends messengers and he says, you need to go to defend the ford. So. So that's where that battle takes place is along the Jordan. But in defending that that border, I mean, would you go on? The, would you stay on the west side, or would you cross and go on the east side and get them once they cross? I'm not sure, right? So I'm saying I'm saying from a battle perspective, mm -hmm. you keep them on the west side. You let somebody else get the stragglers, those that get past that are trying to get to the east, because you're yeah. trying to shut them off from what could be their their lines of support and from additional manpower. Okay. Yeah, so we just don't get enough details to know exactly how this battle plays out, like how the you know the armies are situated and, and so forth. We just got a sketch of it. So we'd have to guess a bit, but well, see the, the problem that I'm having is that when once you start to ford a river, yeah, your your troops, your people are more vulnerable because they're exposed. That's why I would think that you would want to be on the east side of the Jordan, catching them as they ford. Because if you're on the west side, then you're facing a whole army. But once they start to ford, they have to come into smaller groups. I mean, there's only, you know, so much area that you can ford the Jordan. And then you're going to be vulnerable once you cross. But that that's just me not, not being a military strategist ever, so... So I don't know how you would. Well, if we if we made, and this could be a very strange application, if we look at the battles that occurred against Germany in December of 1944. The, the battle in the Ardennes, which became known as the Battle of the Bulge, wound up being one where they were able to slow down the German advance. But once they slowed down the German advance, they wanted to deal with what they had to to keep the German army from being able to regroup. So they began taking several bridges. Mm -hmm. And the whole point about taking the bridges was to keep it so that they could not continue their retreat. Mm -hmm. So the, the question about the Ford is very much, to me, it's very similar about this with bridges. Right. Okay. So they've taken the two princes. We're not talking the kings. We're talking two princes. We're talking Oreb and Zeb, the raven and the wolf. We're talking about a scavenger and 
a canine that is seen as being very destructive. They slew all at the wine, they slew at the wine press of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Why did they bring the heads of these two princes? What can we say about that? Well, it shows that they're destroyed. Is there another symbol for the head itself? Well, it represents the leadership. Well, in Revelation, we have a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Mm -hmm. Is there something we can draw from that to tell us what they're looking at here about the heads of Oreb and Zeb? And I'm, I'm not disagreeing with your idea of them being part of leadership or to show that they're being destroyed. I'm just asking, is there anything else that we haven't considered? Well, there's two heads. I mean, it could be church and state even as a symbol. I don't know. A raven and a wolf, how you would get those as church and state. But the thing is, there's two. Okay. All right. So we've come again to the end of Judges 7. We know now that they have taken the two princes of the Midianites and they have slain them. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we have not completely covered in this chapter? Are there other symbols we should be considering? Well, I mean, I still have to deal with the numbering of these tribes and what they mean. But, um, you know, that I'm going to do after I get back. Okay. Now, we don't have enough time really to start Judges 8. And it would probably be best that we address Judges 8 and be, at least begin to address it tomorrow. Yeah, we could just begin to address it because that's going to be our last study until um, the 31st. Till the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. So now, I'm going to be trying to, I mean, obviously when I'm backpacking, I'm not going to be able to. Uh, bring my computer with me or anything why not <laughs> well i'd have no way to power it um so um otherwise i'd bring it but so um actually i wouldn't but <laughs> so um but I'll, I'll i'll still be thinking about these things the thing that i find interesting is these it's the differences between uh, the tribes and, and just specifically, you know, Zebulun from Numbers 2 to Numbers 26 and the same with each of these tribes. The numbers are, are interesting, um, you know, especially Asher being 11,900. But also you have two of the tribes, Naphtali and Ephraim, are they lose 8,000 each of them in that 38 years. And Manasseh gains 20,500. Um, now, the thing, of course, when we're dealing with these numbers, these wouldn't be the actual numbers at the time when Gideon has this uh, battle because 
um, you know, they're going to be changing. Those numbers will constantly be changing, and this is some years after they were counted. But, um, but these are the only numbers we have as symbols. So I think they're still valid, even if they're not the actual numbers at that time. So that's the thing that I'm thinking about, because they do represent spans of time, as we have shown. Um, you know, for instance, Stephen is born 11,900 days before September 11, 2001. Okay. So, and then he's he also has a relationship to uh, um, other dates. So, so anyway, the point is that we have um, we have these can represent spans of time. And of course, eleven thousand nine hundred is also uh, thirty two years and seven months. The difference between the solar uh, thirty two years and seven months on the Gregorian calendar and thirty three years and seven months on the Islamic calendar. So it's this alignment which we use in the 391 years because it's 391 months 11,900 days so um yeah so just that one alone we have these symbols but there must be more um that we haven't considered right there must be um something else that we haven't seen or we haven't there's some some part of this puzzle that's still missing to me right so you know i'm pretty sure we will find that as time goes on okay any other comments or thoughts about this today Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this study. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together so that we could examine carefully items and questions that we all have. Father, please guide us, direct us today, show us that that you would have us to understand. May your will be done. Help us through our weakness to become strong in you and to consider items from these studies as we go through our day so that your character may be more clearly represented to all of those with whom we come in contact. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.